welcome to the Digital Planning Podcast. This series is designed to educate individuals about all things digital in connection with estate planning, business planning, and estate administration. To keep up with all things digital, please subscribe to iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or wherever you download your podcasts. And now, Jennifer Ziegel, a partner at Kleinbird LLC, Ross Bruck, a principal of Estate Genie, and Justin Brown, a partner at Troutman Pepper Hamilton Sanders LLP, with today's topic. Welcome to the Digital Planning Podcast. I'm Ross with my co-hosts, Jen and Justin, and today we're listening to part two of our interview with Pamela Morgan. Planning in the space is not necessarily a one-size-fits-all approach, but for a person just trying to implement a basic level plan that might only have a small amount of crypto or at least a small amount valued now, what would you recommend that they consider in terms of their own personal shore plan? Great question. Uh, so a couple of things. One, obviously, I would recommend that they see their trusted uh, digital planning lawyer uh, because their their lawyer is going to be able to incorporate what they want to do within their greater context of their estate. However, I've published a number of resources on my website. They are 100% free. They are free to you, lawyers. They are free to your clients. I know, I know, I'm breaking the cardinal rule. No free work. Um, <laughs> this is one of the things I love about this industry is that you know we're building things on open source software, and I've tried to take that and incorporate that into my practice. So I do try to provide a lot of resources for free. There are two resources in particular that I would recommend. One of them is a cryptocurrency inventory. So it's simply a list that allows your heirs to know what cryptocurrencies you have and where to look for them. So for example, if you have an account with the with Kraken, who is uh, an exchange. You would put on your cryptocurrency inventory, I have some, some cryptocurrency, some Bitcoin, some Ether at Kraken. And that should be enough to let your uh, estate person or your trustee, whomever it is, um, understand how to access that, right? Now, obviously your trustee is gonna need access that's greater than that. But if we're talking about something that you can do today, right this second, you could start filling out that that inventory, and then start actually implementing those things where you're transferring, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the second thing is a letter to loved ones. And I love this letter, not just because I wrote it, <laughs> but because um, I think that it's a really nice way to introduce your loved ones to the idea of cryptocurrencies, and most importantly, the idea that they're going to need help transferring these cryptocurrencies and giving them direction on who they can go to to help them. So in the letter to loved ones, it basically says, hi, you know, I want you to know that I have cryptocurrencies. Uh, anyone who helps you might be able to steal them. So you're going to need to watch them. And here are some people or some organizations that can help you. These are people that I trust. And here's how to get a hold of them. And here's a photo. And here's their contact information or whatever. And kind of giving your loved ones a roadmap on not this is how you use a key. And then you have to transfer this. And then you have to put your passphrase in and buy a Trezor and blah, blah. Like, no, <laughs> no. Just give them the names of some trusted people who can help them through the process. And I think that those are the two things that people can do today that will actually make a difference in the inheritability of their crypto assets. So Pamela, some individuals buy crypto assets solely for the purpose of leaving it to their descendants. How would you alter that process if you knew that the client you're working with has no interest in ever selling it during his or her lifetime, but wants it to be there as a gift for future descendants to take advantage of? Would, it, would the process change or be exactly the same with the same instructions being left in that manner? I think it really depends on the technological um, acumen of your client. So if your client is the kind of person who are holding their own keys, then that's a different conversation than if you have someone who is, you know, only has an account on a cryptocurrency exchange and they're using a custodian and they want to uh, have you know their their custodial account part of it passed to their to their grandkids or or to their children or whomever. Uh, I think that this is where 
that your estate planning attorney, again, really comes into play because they can help you not only with figuring out exactly how to do it, but also how to do it within the parameters of you know, minimizing your tax burden, making sure that your cost basis transfers to your heirs, making sure that all of those things happen, as well as making sure that they have access. I know personally of some people who have done things like purchased a, a cryptocurrency hardware wallet. They've purchased a Trezor, for example, and they've transferred crypto assets onto the Trezor, and now they keep those Trezors in, you know, safes and they have backups, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, they're planning on passing down their crypto assets in that manner. There are some caveats to that kind of planning uh, because Trezors and, and any sort of software requires updates. And so, you know, that's fine if you're talking about short term. But if you're talking about not touching a Trezor for 20 years, Eee, I mean, the, the, you know, our industry hasn't even been around for 20 years. So, you know, this is one of the challenges that we face with estate planning and with long term planning is we are looking at long term and there really isn't a lot of long term solutions available right now. So I would say to answer your question, to the extent that you can use traditional systems, right, you can name in your will what you want to have happen. You can put these assets in trust, which is fairly easy to do, depending on whether or not you, you know, you have a revocable or an irrevocable trust or what kind of trust you have. Um, you know, you can deal with the inheritance planning or the passing along of assets in that way, just as you would any other personal property. Um, the question is really about how do you want to do this from a practical perspective? Do you want from an access perspective, I guess, is the best way to think about it. So one of the things that we deal with as estate planning attorneys is um, administering people's estates after they die and filing a state tax return, uh, which leads to valuation issues. And mm -hmm. how do you value cryptocurrencies, the various types of cryptocurrencies? Um, but so I, I have a question about how do you value these cryptocurrencies, but do keys have value also independent of the cryptocurrency? This is a great question. Um, in my opinion, which again is my opinion only because this is a whole brand new area of law. For those of you who are listening and excited and want to do something different, uh, th this is the area to get involved with because it is kind of the wild, wild west. Uh, it's kind of, you know, make a great argument and see if it sticks. And it's it's really very interesting. Um, do keys have value? In my opinion, they do not. And the reason that they do not is because if I have, for example, a key to my car, okay, and I give you, Justin, a spare key to my car, do you have the value of my car? No. Correct. So, but could you then get in my car and drive it away and deprive me of the value of it? Yes, of course. Same thing. So it's kind of the same thing with cryptocurrencies, right? If we have a key, it doesn't actually have inherent value. Another way to think about this is if you have, imagine that instead of this whole private key discussion, we'll just chuck that for a second. Let's assume that you just need a pin, right? Just a pin like you have on your debit card. Right. If you know my pin, does that give you, you know, does the pin have any value in and of itself? No. Correct. I, I, I when I say correct, I mean, I agree with you now, whether a court will agree with us, Justin, we don't know, but we hope so, because it makes perfect sense that the key or the access credential itself does not have value, right? It's the underlying asset that actually has value. Now, if you use that credential to deprive someone of value, then there would be a cause of action against the person you know, who deprived you of the property. But it doesn't mean that that key necessarily has any value in and of itself. I think that analogy works. And, and I think it, as you said, you, you made an argument and, and um, it is the wild, wild west. And, and I, think, I think that makes a lot of sense um, there are those who believe that keys do have value, which create a whole host of problems um, for the holders of those keys, right? And, and as you were talking about the situation where Ross and Jen are holding keys, 
um, my mind went to, oh my goodness, do they have value in their estates, right? Have we, have we added value to their estates? Um, have we given them something called powers of appointment, so to speak? So it's, it's, it's interesting to see where this discussion goes down the road. Absolutely. I, I completely agree with you. And I think one of the one of the primary issues that we're going to see play out is I don't think it's going to be a problem for people who actually have a legal plan as well as an access plan. Right. So if you have a, a will that clearly states, you know, what you have and you and you say, OK, I'm holding these keys, but I'm actually holding uh, this key is actually a copy of Jen's key. And I'm holding this for John and you clearly mark it. And it's obviously you've made you've done something to make it clear that it's not actually part of my estate, but it's part of Jen's property. Right. I don't actually have an ownership interest in it. Then hopefully the legal system would you know, acknowledge that and allow John to have her property. How we actually do that from, again, a practical perspective versus a legal perspective. Th this is all kind of making things up as we go. And one of the one of the other issues that I think you touched on is this idea of, you know, negative control or having control dispersed among so many parties. If you have a multi signature where Jen and Ross each have a key and it requires both of them to come together in order to spend. Right. You have negative power, but you don't have positive power. And these terms have been explored a lot in the land of cryptocurrency, trying to figure out. And, and one of the big issues is we try to fit cryptocurrency within the definition of the things we already know. <laughs> and one of the problems with doing that is that cryptocurrency in many ways is a completely new thing. And so that doesn't mean that we have to start from zero, but it does mean that we have to think carefully about how our old systems actually do relate to these new things. And instead of trying to kind of force them in like, oh, we have this system and you will fit, uh, which which doesn't really work from a logical perspective. Maybe we need to start thinking about how to actually problem solve. What are the problems that we have and then how do we solve them? So um, I do want to talk about one other quick thing about multi-signature. I love multi-signature so much and I love it because it takes the people out of it. So um, one of the early articles I wrote on this topic was about um, changing client trust accounts and changing IOLTA accounts and making them multi-signature. And basically, instead of having amazing reading material in our bar journals about how our colleagues have appropriated client funds, we'll have to have those pages be empty in the bar journal. The, the grievance people will have to be sad because they're not going to get the same number of cases that they have now. Um, but, you know, we can stop this issue of attorneys running away with client funds by putting them into these accounts that have technological constraints that are not trusting the lawyer to not do something bad, but rather allowing the client to do a simple approval on their phone and click the click the button. Right. And allowing them to have a more collaborative and, and um, be more involved in what's actually happening with their lawyer's office and what's actually happening with their case. So a lot of lawyers don't love that idea, but that's OK. I still like you anyway. Um, the thing is, is I think this is an interesting application of multi signature. You can also and, and early on in my career, I did a lot of planning with investors in small businesses. So instead of doing, for example, a two of two, we did a three of five where three signatures were required and an investor held one key. So the investor could come in and collaborate with the CEO and the CFO, but the investor didn't have to be part of every single transaction, but they were still had some piece of control. So there's this whole new world that's opening up to how do we do control? And if that wasn't enough, Hope you guys are sitting down because there are new things that are coming out, including multi-level conditional statements. And you're like, whoa, computer lady, shush. All right, don't be afraid. They are, they are simply ways that you can constrain this bit Bitcoin to say, OK, Jen and Ross can spend together any time within the next year, but Justin can spend by himself after two years. So you can start building 
these different levels of control in and you can start thinking about, well, what happens when we start controlling assets in a completely new and different way and start having this time element to them? And I think that's absolutely fascinating. I'm on the edge of my seat. Tell us. <laughs> well, I, I, I will tell you one more thing about these technologies. My colleague, I, I mentioned him very early on in this episode, Andreas Antonopoulos, which is who I initially learned from Bitcoin about. Um, I've been very fortunate to work with him over the years. And he's a prolific speaker. If you don't know about him, you should definitely look him up. But he invented this concept called streaming money. And I think he, he does talks about them. And I think it's in one of his books called The Internet of Money. But anyway, so this concept of streaming money is as follows. When does your paycheck hit your bank account? Every week? every month, every other week, why? Why? Why do you only get paid once every other week? Why do you only get paid once a month? Well, this is a relic from the old payment system, right? This is a relic from when we used to have people physically sitting down and handwriting checks and doing checks and balances. Everything is digitized now. But why do we still do paychecks every two weeks? We don't have to with digital money like this. We could actually get to a point where we're doing something called streaming money, where you're getting paid by the millisecond to actually every millisecond you're working for a client, you're getting paid. Ooh, the lawyers got excited. Okay, not really. Um, <laughs> so let me ask a planning, a gifting question. Uh, if I uh, advise a client to set up a trust and put multiple signature authentication on the assets in that trust, have I really made a gift if I hold one of those signatures? If every time the beneficiary is going to receive a payment and, and or use any assets that are in that trust, they can't do so without my signature or another trustee's signature, have I completed the gift for gift purposes? And take it a step further, what about an UTMA account or an UGMA account where a parent wants to put money aside for the benefit of their child, but then they realize, oh my goodness, they're going to have access to this at age 18 or age 21, and I don't love that idea. What if I put this, uh, you know, an asset in there that requires multiple signatures and it requires my signature? And yes, we can have a, a legal fight about after they turn 21 or after they turn 18, and I'm not allowing them to have that signature, but at least I'll know. At least it's some added level of protection for me to protect my child or my grandchild from having unlimited access to this. Has this been thought out in terms of uh, the, the, the planning implications? Not at all. <laughs> so so from, from my understanding, not really. You know, this is an area where estate planners grapple for sure. I'm not aware of any papers on this issue, although they might, there might be some out there, but I'm not aware of any definitive work out there that says, you know, whether or not the gift has been completed um, or, you know, the idea of putting limits on most. So I will tell you that the vast majority of attorneys who are, who are helping clients in this space, the vast majority of trustees are single key. They're not even considering multi-signature. Um, now, people who are dealing with large sums of money, very large sums of cryptocurrencies, they have to start doing multi-signature because it's simply imprudent, uh, one might argue negligent even, to try and you know hold a ton of cryptocurrency if you're not a fiduciary, if you're not, if you're not in the business of doing that. So, um, you know, I, I don't have a good answer for you, but maybe you guys can find someone who does have the answer and then bring them on the podcast and then I will listen to the episode and I will be super excited to learn the answer. Yeah, I think it's, a, it's an interesting gray area because you're doing it for security purposes, not for gift withholding purposes. But under the code, you could argue that you have retained interest in that asset because it can't leave without your approval. Uh, well, yeah. That's that's a huge issue. And so for the people who are doing, you know, um, multi-signature uh, trust planning for high net worth individuals, this is a big concern of how you distribute the keys among trustees and whether or not those trustees actually have a relationship between one another. So you could, in theory, have a bunch of people who don't know each other, 
you could create a scheme whereby you actually have a number of trustees where the only person who knows how the how the key signatures have to go are limited to you know pers are limited to me for example right and i could create a signature uh, a scheme where you know jennifer holds a key and my business partner holds a key and another lawyer that i know in florida holds a key but none of them know who the other key holders are and they can only come together right through the direction of this documentation et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you can deal with these problems, but there is unfortunately no eloquent way to do it. There is no you know, easy process that you can go, oh yes, I'm gonna plug and play this thing. There is no you know, draft template for this. This is something that's very, very customized and it requires you know, expertise. Can you create a succession listing for these keys? Um, who can be the key holders, right? So if, if something happens to Ross, can I designate somebody as his successor? And on top of that, if you can, can you place limitations as to who that successor could be or who that successor cannot be? So I will start with the practical. From a practical perspective, once you know something, you can't unknow it and you have full access to it. Meaning that if I, if, if you have a key, Justin, and you give it to me, you can say, you know, here's my key and here it is, Pamela, and you now have the key and you now have the legal responsibility to do whatever it is. From a practical perspective, can I run away with the money? Yes. <laughs> From a legal perspective, you know, should I be able to do that? No, right? So I, I think, and, and maybe I misunderstood your question, but I think, you know, can keys be handed down? You know, can you take your key and give it to your heirs? Yes, you can from a practical perspective. Um, yes, you can, I think, from a legal perspective. However, I'm not a big fan of it, and I'm I'm on the fence about it, okay? I'll just, I'll be honest about this. I'm on the fence. It really depends on your client's situation, but I, I don't love the idea of people inheriting keys for one major reason, and that is because you don't know who else has backups of those keys, unless your client keeps meticulous records, unless your client and you and the heirs actually trust the people who are holding the backup keys which is a whole nother issue, right? Because remember that every backup key is basically like having full access if you're in a single key situation. So if you inherit a key, you have to trust that you know who else has copies of that key and that they're not going to use it ever and that they're not going to lose it or that it's gonna fall into someone's hands and they're going to steal your assets. So that's why I'm not a big fan, however, the only way to get those assets out of that key is to do a transaction and lock them to a new key. So unfortunately, that could be, although I would argue that it's not, considered a taxable event, right? If you're moving cryptocurrency from one key to another key, the question is, would the IRS consider that a taxable event? They consider it if you're moving from one asset to another asset. I don't think that they should consider it a taxable event because you're not changing the value you're not you know you're not changing anything in any way all you're doing is simply making it more secure but they have not as far as i know uh, um, published any sort of opinion about this this is again a really nuanced thing so so it it yeah. sounds almost like a crypto decanting right? <laughs> yes yeah, that's exactly right that's a great way to explain it. yes so going back to our conversation about uh, putting crypto assets in a trust, do you have any general thoughts or other recommendations about that? I do. Uh, there is one thing that you'll definitely want to include. If you want your trustee to hold these assets for the benefit of your beneficiaries, you're going to need to include a, a, a statement that clearly says that you are aware of the volatility of these assets and directing the trustee to keep the assets and not to diversify and to and you're going to have to include the statement of indemnification and the reason is because typically 
a trustee, especially one who's not well versed in cryptocurrencies. So for example, if you do a pour over and you end up with a trustee who didn't know that they were getting a hold of cryptocurrencies, um, they might say, whoa, now this is way too volatile. We need to, you know, we need to get rid of these assets. And if that's not what you want, you must say so affirmatively. You cannot rely on the trustee because, you know, the trustee doesn't want to get sued and the beneficiaries, you know, don't, you don't want to have the beneficiaries have um, expectations that the trustee will know necessarily how to manage these assets adequately and will be able to make the right decisions. And, you know, in these days, is there really a right decision? You know, over the last however many months, you know, the, the price of cryptocurrencies has skyrocketed. Well, you know, if, if you were a trustee six months ago, maybe you thought, OK, this is the high and I should diversify a bit. And, you know, now do you have beneficiaries who are upset because you didn't hold on? You know, there are a lot of questions when it comes to owning assets as volatile as these. And so in order to protect yourselves and in order to protect your clients, I think it's really, really important that they have a statement of intention. I think that's a great tip, and I'm sure a lot of our audience members will appreciate that and hopefully avoid malpractice claims now. Yes. <laughs> so, Pamela, I know you're extremely busy right now and you have a lot going on, but are you working on any other new projects that you'd like to tell us about? Yes, I'm currently working on two different projects that I would like for you and your listeners to be aware of. One of them is I'm working on a book specifically written for people who are inheriting cryptocurrency. Unfortunately, not enough people in our industry are doing planning, and so many of them are dying without an access or legal plan. And so we end up with a lot of lawyers who are trying to help their clients figure out, hey, you know, does, does this person have any crypto assets? You end up in a situation where people think like, oh, you know, um, this person died and I thought they were into crypto, but I can't find anything. What do I do? I'm working on a book specifically for if you think that your loved one has cryptocurrency and of where to look and what to do. The second thing is that I am a board member of C4, which is the Cryptocurrency Certification Consortium, which is a nonprofit industry group uh, based in Canada. And we do lots of things. You might have heard of the CBP, which is the Certified Bitcoin Professional. Uh, we're also coming out with a CEP, which is the Certified Ethereum Professional. And the purpose of this organization is to create industry standards uh, written by the community for the community so that people can demonstrate their knowledge in these things. Because one of the difficulties we have is how do I as a professional actually demonstrate that I have the requisite knowledge? How do I demonstrate to clients? How do I demonstrate to potential colleagues that I actually know what I'm talking about? And so the certified Bitcoin professional exam was the first exam that we created that helps people um, in a professional setting say, yeah, I actually know about this. I was the second lawyer to pass the exam. This was before I sat on the board. I was super excited. I thought I was the first. I tweeted out on it on crypto Twitter and the head of the board was like, well, actually, you're the second. <laughs> I was like, ah, oh. <laughs> anyway. So, um, you know, I, I wanted to tell people about that project. And then specifically, we are working on putting together um, a certified legal cryptocurrency professional um, committee. And that committee will work on creating standards for like what should lawyers know about cryptocurrencies? What should people who are you know, practicing law or supporting lawyers know about these things? And then creating an industry exam that's based upon those standards and then credentialing people so that they understand that. So if any of the listeners are interested in, in learning more about that, uh, you can contact the organization at cryptoconsortium.org. Pamela, you have been a wealth of information today. Um, and if our listeners have any questions, what's the best way for them to reach you? Best way to reach me, and thank you so much for the compliment. Um, best way to reach me is my website, empoweredlaw.com. That's E-M-P-O-W-E-R-E-D-L-A-W.com. Or you can reach me on crypto Twitter at Pamela JD. Get it? Pamela with the law. Okay. Only lawyers ever get that humor. And half of them are like, oh, really? Uh, yes, but Pamela JD on Twitter. I'm also on LinkedIn, so you can find me there as well. 
Thank you so much. You are amazing. And you are a rock star in this space. And thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us today. It's been absolutely my pleasure. I hope to be able to come back and, and hang out and talk crypto and death and estate planning with you guys again soon. Thank you. Thanks, Pamela. And to all of our viewers, we want to again thank Pamela Morgan for everything she did and, and taking the time today to talk with us. We'll see you next time on the Digital Planning Podcast. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Digital Planning Podcast, the podcast designed to educate individuals about all things digital in connection with estate planning, business planning, and estate administration. Please subscribe to this podcast and leave us a rating or review on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or wherever you download your podcasts. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time. This podcast is not intended nor should be relied upon as legal advice, nor is it creating any attorney-client relationship with a listener and the hosts or guests. The information provided is only for educational and informational purposes, and the information provided will likely change.